If we look at Brian Laundrie's Instagram profile through the lens of psychodynamic theory, if we do Freudian analysis on his profile, interesting patterns emerge. We see repression of anger. We see signs of self-hatred and projection of that self-hatred onto the world. In this video, I'm going to walk you through the process of psychoanalyzing his Instagram profile so that you can see firsthand his true nature. But I can't just dive into his profile without giving you some background information on psychodynamic theory. So let's quickly get that out of the way. In our culture, we are fascinated by killers. We are fascinated by psychopaths. We love our Ted Bundys, our Jeffrey Dahmers. We even love fictional characters like Dexter. Ask yourself, why are we so fascinated by these types of killers? Why are we so fascinated by these types of psychopaths? The reason is, because they throw our sense of safety into question. When you meet somebody who's extroverted, who's friendly, who's nice, who's charming, he jokes a lot, what's your first thought? Well, it's probably not, he's gonna kill me. Most likely your first thought is, wow, that dude is cool. I wanna hang out with him more. It's precisely this that these psychopaths throw into question. They throw into question our ability to trust our own instincts. Luckily, Mother Nature is a lot more clever than that because 77% of us still get a palpable reaction when we interact with someone who is truly psychopathic. Most people who interact with actual psychopaths like that, they'll report a skin sensation, like their skin is crawling. They'll say that something feels really off. Perhaps you might have remembered an interaction like that in your life. You can trust that feeling. But what if I was to tell you that that type of a psychopath is only half of the picture? There's a whole other group of psychopaths who present completely the opposite way. Yes, they are still aggressive. They are still hostile. They are still impulsive. But everything else about them is like a mirror opposite. All psychopaths are known to be impulsive, aggressive, and hostile. One is like the one that we are most afraid of. The charming type, the extroverted type, the self-confident type. The other is socially anxious, has low self-esteem, is moody, and is withdrawn. Now, right off the bat, which one does Brian Laundry sound like to you? If you've seen any of the police tapes, or maybe if you've seen the YouTube video that Gabby Petito and Brian Laundry put up on their YouTube channel, then you would have noticed that Brian Laundry oftentimes plays second fiddle to Gabby Petito. He does not chase after the limelight. And I know I've heard people say that, well, he was jealous. That's why he killed her. I don't think so. I take people at face value. What someone is doing shows us what they want. Brian Laundrie wanted to be in the background. He did not want to take center stage. Brian Laundrie might have had what is known as secondary psychopathy. As you might have guessed it, your Ted Bundy, your Jeffrey Dahmer, your fictional killer Dexter, those are individuals who would classify as having primary psychopathy. Primary psychopathy is inborn. It is genetic. There is some sort of a genetic difference where the individual does not feel empathy and they register a whole lot less anxiety. Secondary psychopathy, however, is more learned. All right, the first thing that we gotta do is to understand through the psychodynamic lens how psychopathies, both the primary and the secondary, develop for individuals. Like most things in the psychodynamic theory, it all starts in the childhood. Specifically, psychodynamic theorists believe that the problem occurs in faulty internalization. Internalization or assimilation, as some other people refer to it, is a process of taking messages from the world about the world, about how we should relate to the world and making it our own. It's kind of like a copy and paste procedure. We do not come up with these rules ourselves. We simply just take what the world tells us and we don't question it. That unquestioning absorption of world rules is a healthy and natural process in your early life. Later on, we wanna digest what we hear. But early on in life, we're not smart enough to digest things and reach our own conclusions. Instead, we have to absorb a child who has primary psychopathy, who genetically simply does not feel consequences the same way the rest of us do. They do not feel empathy. They do not feel fear the same way we do. Will not respond to cause and effect the same way we do. This means that they will not receive the same types of teachings. They'll struggle to learn that boundaries should not be crossed, that they shouldn't hurt other people. And if we try to understand this through the psychodynamic lens, what we realize is that their id and ego are merged into one. 
In the psychodynamic theory, every person has an id, an ego, and a superego. And you can think of them existing on the same continuum. The id represents your raw animalistic impulses. It's when you want to lie and cheat and steal and moita. The superego, on the other hand, is the part of you that knows right from wrong. It represents societal rules of what you should and shouldn't do. And finally, the ego represents a balancing act between your id and the superego. Your ego is the part of you that helps you determine when you can do white lies and when you shouldn't lie. That's the part that negotiates societal rules of right and wrong and what is practical. So for example, if your girlfriend asks you if she looks fat, you'll probably answer, no honey, no you don't, even though you're lying. Inversely, if your wife asks you, did you bring the children to the doctor? You know that, hmm, that's not a good idea for me to lie, even though my id says lie so you avoid the consequences. You'll still tell the truth because you realize, you know what, this is important. So for someone who has primary psychopathy for them because they don't experience consequences the same way they never have a need to create an ego instead they just always live in this id place the place of just impulses i want it i go get it if i have to lie to get it i'll do that if i have to kill somebody to get it I'll do that. And they very well might understand what their societal rules are, but they don't have an internal drive in terms of fear or empathy or guilt or remorse to motivate them to negotiate between the superego and the id. So that is how a primary psychopath develops. However, for a secondary psychopath, they have an id, an ego, and a superego. But there exists some sort of a malfunction in the process of internalizing healthy worldviews. Dr. Malloy, who takes particular interest in understanding how psychopaths grow up to be psychopaths, explains that in some instances, our psychopath does not have to not have empathy and not have a lack of fear. Instead, they could have a naturally elevated expression of aggression. And in spite of the best parenting possible, that elevated level of natural aggression will be re-internalized into a predator-prey worldview. Both in the primary and the secondary psychopathies, narcissistic traits are elevated. This is because if your entire life you see the world through a predator and prey dynamic, the oppressor or the oppressed, a winner and a loser, then you're inevitably going to be much more self-centered. This is what I suspect to be the most likely scenario in the case of Brian Laundrie. But something that I'm going to add is that if a child is showing a higher than average level of aggression, there's also the high likelihood that the parents will try to stifle that aggression. And this stifling of aggression is what can lead to repression and eventual projection. Okay, so now we're ready to jump into his Instagram profile. Broadly speaking, there is about two categories of art that he showcases. He's a big fan of destruction and nihilism. I would put that in one category. And the other category is anti-hero. Here's some of his art and he labels this Grim Reaper leading sheep to the slaughter and a mousetrap. We also learned that he's a pretty big fan of Fight Club and the theme of Fight Club is kind of nihilistic. It communicates a certain type of dissatisfaction with our society. Next, we have Joker. That's again, nihilism and anti-hero. Here we have another nihilistic example, some more nihilism and destruction. Here's some art that kind of suggests predation. But what's also important is the movie that this is referencing. Tim Burton's Beetlejuice is another example of an anti-hero character. Here we have a straight up example of predation. Here we have some more predation, destruction and murders. I believe this one is from a game. And lastly, there's another example of the anti-hero. He says he's a big fan of Hellboy. So to recap, we got Hellboy, Fight Club, and Beetlejuice. If you know these movies, then you know they feature an anti-hero. And what's an anti-hero? An anti-hero is someone who has evil natures, yet still somehow ends up being the good guy. The reason why a lot of us love anti-heroes is because we can relate to them. We see our own evil impulses, but we see a hero who's able to turn those evil impulses into something that's good. Brian Laundrie's fascination with these anti-heroes represents hope. Hope that he can take the darkness, the destruction, and the aggressive impulses within him and transform them and be accepted by society at large. Now you might be asking yourself, what aggressive impulses? So I've already shown you a handful of destruction and nihilistic type of art that he's made, but now check this out. The caption to this photo is kind of lengthy, so let me just highlight to you the most important line. Brian Laundrie writes, I think our culture, our society, has put itself above all living creatures, creating needs 
purely to support destructive economic practices. Let me reread the most important part. Creating needs purely, purely to support destructive economic practices. He assigns evil intent to humans. Okay, I can hear people saying, what do you mean to humans? There's no mention of humans. Maybe he's just talking about culture and society. Well, check out the caption on this photo. Zion is proof that mankind can ruin anything, even in an effort to preserve it. Beautiful park, just with an unfortunate infestation of human beings. Okay, hopefully now things are starting to add up. But wait, there's more. Notice the pictures where he is posing in nature. Notice how small he is in comparison to the rest of the image. Out of all of these photos, I think there's maybe only two where he is moderately large in relation to the background. In everything else, he's so small that you can hardly see him. What does this communicate? It communicates, I am not important. People are not important. Humanity is an infestation. Don't look at me, look at the background instead. That's the important stuff. This to me represents how he feels about himself, but also a projection onto the rest of humanity. This is a product of his aggression and destructive impulse. This destructive impulse likely was the thing that was re-internalized and turned into a worldview of predator and prey, of winner and loser, of oppressor and oppressed. His fascination with the anti-hero represents hope, Hope that he can do something with that darkness within him. Now here's a guess as to what probably happened in his early childhood. Perhaps he showed a lot of aggression as a kid. And his parents, of course, tried to tamper that down. They tried to punish his expression of his aggression. What that did is it caused him to repress his aggression. And as Carl Jung said, who is a famous, famous psychologist, what we resist persists and it grows in size. The more we deny one of our natures, including aggression, the more it grows in size. Perhaps what we as a nation have witnessed was the unconscious growth of Brian Laundrie's aggression, culminating in the killing of Gabby Petito. So that concludes my psychoanalysis of Brian Laundrie's Instagram profile. If you made it this far in the video, one thing I'm going to tell you is that, listen, my honest opinion on psychoanalysis and psychoanalytic interpretation, or even Jungian interpretation, is that it's kind of like astrology for psychologists. Is it possible that that's exactly what happened? Sure, it's possible. Is it more likely than any other option? I'm not so sure. I say that because I want you to take what I say with a grain of salt, but also take what other people say with a grain of salt. There are really no experts on human behavior. We have statistics, but these statistics, are they're never that good. Because if they were that good, we'd be living in a world of precogs. Like in that movie with, uh, what's his face? You know, that face, that face. But we're not living in that world. Why? Well, because behavioral correlations, behavioral predictions, well, we suck at it. These correlates, you know, they still exist. It's just they're not that powerful. In any case, if you enjoyed this, hit the like button, subscribe, and I will see you in the next video.